to this week's episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. And I am your host, Olga Peters, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. And for those who might be new to the show, the other thing we're doing this summer is looking at what can Vermont learn from outside perspectives. Since we are such a Vermont-centric show, we are, we are looking to hear from other folks who are in the state this weekend, uh, this summer. And to that note, I want to welcome to the show Benjamin Frost, who is the Managing Director on Policy and Public Affairs of the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, also called New Hampshire Housing. And for those who have listened to our shows previously, you might be familiar with our interviews with Mara Collins, who is with the Vermont Housing Financing, Financing Authority. Authority. Thank you. And it's kind of a sister organization to what Mara does. So, Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be and here. It's so great you're here. And we're going to be talking about the second home market, which, of course, regular contributor Emily Kornheiser and I have been talking about a lot. So I'm so glad you're here for this conversation, Emily. We have, and I'm so glad to be here too. And I like to call it the vacation home market or the non-primary home market, because I think for some folks, this might be their third, fourth, or fifth home. And so um, might as well not narrow us down to only second homes when we're talking about it. And I am so glad to be here and diving in on this, because I think this is actually an interestingly New England specific issue in some ways. Mm-hmm. So Ben, just to give you a little lay of the land, um, for Emily and I, so, so Emily's in, in Brattleboro, I'm in Dummerston, but uh, Emily went to Marlboro College, I grew up in the Deerfield Valley, which of course has really big uh, vacation home market uh, with the ski area and, and up in London Dairy with Stratton, uh, there is another large uh, vacation home market. They're not exclusive to just around the ski areas, but um, I have been hearing as a journalist from a, a number of towns that it's getting harder and harder for year round residents or permanent residents, however you want to say that, to find affordable rents. And some folks have told, told me that, hey, maybe it's the second home market and that's the problem, but we'd be sunk without it. And some folks say, oh my gosh, if it wasn't for this vacation home market, we would all be thriving and happy and perfect. <laughs> I'm kind of guessing that the truth is in, in between there somewhere. Uh, so could you help us kind of pull it apart? Like what does it mean to have a large vacation home market on an economy or a housing market? Sure, Olga. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with Vermont and, uh, you know, a, a long time ago, I was the executive director of a regional planning commission that bridged New Hampshire and Vermont. It was the Upper Valley Lake Sunapee Regional Planning Commission. It's now divided between the states. Mm -hmm. So I have I have a sense of Vermont politics, and um, if this qualifies me anymore, my, my wife is from CJ. <laughs> it was a very sad day when she gave up her Vermont uh, driver's license. Um, mm. But uh, you know, so New Hampshire is in in many ways a lot like Vermont in in this respect. You know, the prevalence of vacation homes, second homes, third homes, fourth homes. Uh, what have you. Um, and if you look at, at the New Hampshire market, it's the lakes region, you know, around Lake Winnipesaukee and Squam Lake and, and those areas and the mountains, uh, the Mount Washington Valley centered on Conway and, and going up to, you know, um, Littleton, Franconia, Sugar Hill, that area. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of similarities. Some of it's focused on, um, you know, summertime vacationing, sometimes and some of it's focused on the, the ski areas, uh, but it is all over. Uh, so there's there's a lot of similarities, and I think what we're seeing between our two states is um, similarities of economic impact. Um, so it's a it's kind of a um, can't live with it, can't live without it uh, sort of uh, problem that these these towns face, uh, who have uh, this uh, high proportion of we'll call them vacation homes, uh, homes that are not people's primary residences. They do bring in a lot of really important tax revenue to the municipalities that host those, those, those uh, uh, places. And they don't have the same degree of expenses associated with them. You know, it's often 
often cited as a um, uh, a uh, an, op an opposition support for um, against a, a new housing development, whether it's affordable housing or even high end housing. You know, it's who's going to educate the kids? Well, you know, the, the math is a lot more complex than just that, because people who move into a town also support the local economy. They're the people who buy the goods at stores, who do the shopping, who uh, build community. And that's something I think that we really miss with uh, the, the presence of second homes. We have people who are going there, but who aren't really part of the community. And I think that that's, that's part of the, uh, the, the negative impact of uh, second home development is you get all this um, development that doesn't really add to the community in a, in a way that is more than fiscal. Um, it does do that and that can be helpful, although it depends on how it's done. It can also be a drain on municipal coffers as well. I, so many threads there, so excited. Um, I definitely wanna talk about the cost burden opportunity. I wanna talk about the taxes, um, but I think first I would love to talk about this thread of building community because I think this is a really interesting aspect of that. So there's sort of the spiritual aspect of it, that living next to a home that's vacant three quarters of the time or you know, 99% of the time has a certain um, heavy element to it when you're living there that you don't really have a neighbor. And there's some freedom in that, absolutely. But there's also that, um, you know, there's no one to borrow sugar from um, and there's no one to fight with inside your own mind about you know whatever is on their lawn it's just a that's a very very different thing um and at a street that has multiple houses like that it's very hard for neighborhoods to come together right um and then in some communities where you have you know 50 percent of the folks or even more if it's the whole community the crew of volunteers that our communities in vermont and i believe your communities in new hampshire rely on in terms of just the amount of volunteerism that we expect in order to keep all of the trains running to the, as you know, well as they do. Um, we don't have that either. Mm -hmm. What are the other sort of, what are the other sort of threads of that lost community that you see over in New Hampshire about this? Well, I'll, I'll start with a, a community that's, that's not lost. And uh, it's my, my little town of, of Warner, New Hampshire. It's uh, you know, I, I describe it to people who aren't familiar with the area as, as the place where Boston stops on its way to Vermont. Uh, it's exit nine on I-89. But, you know, it's a lot more than exit nine. It's more than the market basket and the McDonald's and uh, the state liquor store, of course. Um, uh, there is actually a village uh, that is really uh, great, pretty vibrant, although it has suffered from COVID. Um, most of the restaurants in town closed, but are now uh, reopening. Uh, which is a great sign. Um, Warner, in fact, in the, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, was one of the centers of the New Hampshire ski industry. Mm -hmm. It had a little slope. I, it was called, you know, a Breakneck Hill, I think. And there was, um, not ironically, a crutch factory at the bottom of the hill. Um, but, you know, the trains. <laughs> what were, factory? Crutch factory, you know, wooden crutches. So you, oh. you <laughs> pee down, break your leg, and you get a crutch at the bottom. Um, is it, you know, That's a good symbiotic relationship between business. <laughs> good thinking there. Um, but it's now a town of about 3,000 people, but the trains would come up from Boston and the whole town would come together and feed the people, you know, the couple thousand people, the entire John Hancock company, the insurance company would do its ski day in Warner for years and years and years until finally it just, uh, you know, collapsed under... Uh, the, the, the weight of the size of the thing and you know, the, the development of much larger uh, commercial ski areas. Uh, but it was really a community effort uh, to bring people to Warner. And there were also, for summertime people, there were camps around uh, some of the, you know, we don't have real big lakes, but we call them lakes, ponds in Warner that have now developed into year round residences. So I'd say this is a really positive development from um, uh, uh, tourism uh, industry that we saw uh, in my little town. But then you look at, you know, places like, um, you know, Woodstock and Lincoln, you know, wh which are um, on the, the west end of the, the kank up on uh, I-93. 
Mm-hmm. And um, what you have in, in, um, in Lincoln in particular is a tremendous amount of uh, condominium development um, you know, associated with the, the ski areas there. And those are people who just come and go. And, and as Emily said, you know, people, if you get a street of houses and one of them is year round occupied, the rest of them are short term rentals. But people occupying those short term rentals, even if it is a regular flow of people, they're not there to interact with the people in the other houses. They're there to, only to interact with the people within the house. So they're not in any way building community. They're not um, uh, adding to uh, the, the fabric of a community. Uh, they're not interested in doing that. That's not what they're there for. They're, they're there to get away from uh, those sorts of things sometimes and to just you know, have some um, time alone. So I think that this is, this is an important consideration for communities that are faced with this kind of development, if that is what they want to do to the degree they can control it. Mm. Because the regulation of the short-term rental market is a a pretty thorny legal question. And it's a thorny political question as well. And I know that politicians in both of our states are wrestling with this. I I thank you, uh, Ben. I think what's, what's standing out for me right now is on that note of community, about purpose when we are in a, an area in a town what is our purpose for being there and i'm sure when all of us have traveled we have very different goals than someone who is in a community full time um and that's just sitting with me the other thing that's sitting with me is um my stepfather used to own an inn and restaurant in downtown wilmington and I remember seeing how the business changed and the business changed for many, many reasons, but I remember seeing a shift in downtown Wilmington as Mount Snow built more and more condos and or lodges on its own property to keep more and more people there all the time and how uh, the the tourist areas in Wilmington kind of, in my experience, emptied out. And I'm talking like 80s, 80s, 90s. This is a while ago. Um, and, and how that changed, just who was coming into town and where the money was going and, and those sorts of things for, for the downtown, at least. And in my experience, I can't say what other people saw, but. I think that's an interesting thing because it's sort of the mark because, um, the vacation home market is indeed such a market um, with so many market forces behind it. The, the place, the sort of trends in what's hot for vacationing changes and you leave, you're left with a lot of emptied out infrastructure as trends change. And as people have a really large, you know, multinational corporations even have a pretty large interest in pushing people to that sort of next hot thing in vacationing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here we have, and I know in New Hampshire, you have um, those lovely roadside motels that were like quite a delightful part of vacationing. And if you can find one that's like still kept up, it's actually really lovely. Um, That now are rent by the week folks, for folks who um, can't afford down payments or um, first and, you know, first and security on an apartment um, and are really for the most part, fairly substandard housing in our area, though they do perform a really important niche in the housing market. They, 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 they do, um, but as, as you point out there, it's, it's not that they're of low quality construction, it's just that they're not intended to be residences. They're intended to be there for overnight stays or for a couple of nights. Uh, but people actually wind up do living in them uh, because they can't afford someplace else. Uh, th- those sorts of places have actually, uh, in some areas, served a benefit during COVID as um, uh, you know for deconcentration of homeless shelters. Mm-hmm. So as people weren't traveling, they weren't going to these these uh, motels. Um, you know, they uh, the shelters were able to use some of the say the CARES Act funding to uh, rent. Uh, spaces in those motels for uh, uh, the homeless population that they couldn't 
continue to house in those same numbers at the shelters themselves because they had to mm-hmm. spread out. Um, and that's but- here, true here as well. And I think we're looking to see how much we can use the ARPA funds to perhaps sustain that and do some um, updates and maintenance on some of those yeah. units to keep and them. Of course, they'll need some retrofitting to be Absolutely. actual resident units, so, you know, to, get, to be a have kitchen, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, you know, the, the thing about, um, I just want to go back to what you talked about, the, the, the shifts of industry. One thing about residences is that they're designed to be residences, and it's easy for them <laughs> to continue to serve that purpose. So... Uh, a big box store, you know, once it's spent its life after 15 years and the, the company moves on or goes bankrupt, um, moves on to a different model, like Walmart, the ever increasing size of the store, they've, as they've increased the sizes of stores, they've abandoned the stores that they've, uh, that they've uh, previously had occupied. Uh, what, what are those to be used for? Now, maybe they'll be used by another company for, that needs a smaller footprint. But we have a lot of those things that are just sitting around vacant or the malls. Malls are really single purpose um, things that, that, and the purpose is gone. People always need a place to live. So the good thing about even vacation homes or second homes is that they can shift between this, these different types of residential uses, whether they're permanent residences or long-term rentals or short-term rentals, they're pretty adaptable. And that, I think that's a good thing. Uh, so but, is but, it, it, it I, the way you frame it, it does sound like a good thing to me if we're talking about an emptying out of vacation homes. But what we're seeing right now in our region, and I'm curious to hear about your region, because they're so um, easy to transform between the two functions, that means that homes that might be permanent homes for people are now becoming vacation homes for people. Yes. Um, and that means that there is no we have no mechanisms of maintaining permanent housing in our community. And, yeah. and that's a question I would love to uh, ask you, Ben, too. When um, an area is shifting between, say, vacation and, and permanent homes, do you see the biggest impact on home ownership or do you see the biggest impact on rent or the rental community? Like, who feels this first, I guess? I- I'm not sure I can say who feels it worse. I can say both feel it. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of examples. I, I looked at some numbers in advance of, of talking with you. Uh, and, and of course, we have the, the census data that, you know, the 2020 census data just came out. So we're all very interested in looking at that. Um, but just remember, the census uh, is reflects the April 1st, 2020 uh, where people were living. And that's just at the beginning of COVID. So we can't look at the, the long, you know, the, the impact of, of COVID in the census numbers, but longer term trends pre-COVID and current COVID. And now we hope post COVID we'll be seeing these patterns. Um, I, so I looked at the, in, in the, the census data, and this is the American community survey, which is the, what replaced the census long form a number of years ago. Um, there's a, a five-year um, uh, uh, grouping of data that looks at, and it, so it's pretty accurate because it's a, a moving average over five years, um, looks at the um, uh, occupied units, and this is in New Hampshire counties, and the vacant units, which is a, a pretty good surrogate for second homes. Some of them are just mm-hmm. vacant because the, the owners uh, aren't there. Uh, but some, um, a good number of them are actually second homes or third homes or fourth homes. They're vacation homes um, statewide in New Hampshire. And I don't know what the numbers are in Vermont. Uh, 16% of all of the units were vacant. Um, this is the, the ACS from 2015 to 2019. So that's a little over 100,000 units in the state that were vacant. So out of a total of 640,000 uh, residential units in the state total. Um, looking at the county numbers and just recognize so that, you know, Coas County is, the, is New Hampshire's northernmost county. It's a lot, the economy is a lot like the Northeast Kingdom um, and it is the least populated county. Uh, and the economy has suffered with uh, the uh, departing of uh, the, the paper mills. Um, 36% 
of the units in Collas County are vacant. So you could infer that um, most of those are probably, um, you know, second homes, uh, camps, uh, what have you. Um, Carroll County, which is the Mount Washington Valley, the area around Conway, New Hampshire, um, and the, the ski area is there and the summer uh, tourism there as well. 48%, um, 48% of all of the units in, in Carroll County are vacant. That is an extraordinary number for an entire county. And most of those are gonna be for vacation purposes. Mm -hmm. um, that has a huge impact on that entire area. And a lot of people would say, great, it's driving the economy. That's what makes Conway uh, as a tourist destination work. And so it's great for the Conway economy. Unless you're an employee and an hourly employee in one of the retail establishments or one of the hospitality establishments trying to find a place to live because the costs have just gone through the roof. Um, we just did, um, New Hampshire Housing does an annual uh, statewide residential rental cost survey. And we just published that uh, last month for 2021. And uh, for, for Carroll County, uh, the, the area around Conway, um, the, the median rent is over $1,000, which might not seem huge, but if you're making you know, 12 bucks an hour, it's, you can't afford that. Uh, and, and, and it's gone up 8.8% uh, .8 since 2020. Wow. Uh, so the prices, the prices are going up. Fast. Yes, Ouch. going up really fast. Um, and so we see, you know, we, and the, the market, the, the housing market, generally speaking, during COVID was just nuts. And, and none of us really expected that. We expected it to tank and it didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're trying to figure out long-term what the impact of COVID is going to be on, on all of these, uh, these things. But uh, it's tough to say right now. Um, so in, you know, like I said, in statewide overall, 16% of the units um, might be second homes, but in places like uh, Coas County, way up north, uh, or Belknap County, which is the Lakes region, 35% are, are vacant or second homes. Carroll County, almost half are, are vacant or second homes. Um, that's a, a huge proportion of all of the units on the market. I'd be curious too in those communities, how many of the folks who actually work in the communities, even in the tourist industry, how many of them still actually live in that community or if they've had to move out and are now commuting in to work? Um, and you know, what, what has happened there as well? Yeah, it's a Would great question. Uh, it, and um, you know, maybe at some point census data will actually reveal if you can stratify commute time uh, mm -hmm. by place of work, by income, uh, that would tell you a lot, or you could do kind of a, a survey, but it is true. I mean, uh, and we hear this anecdotally a lot uh, that people who are working in these industries actually have to drive uh, to where they can afford to live. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. from a, a mortgage purchase standpoint, it's drive till they qualify. Uh, from a rental standpoint, it's drive until you find something you can afford. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, I, I this this issue of affordability is is really key. Uh, and I I read I think it was the recent um, Seven Days uh, had an article yeah. about uh, housing affordability, the housing crunch in Vermont. And there was this story, really poignant story, about this couple that was that lived in Stowe, and they were trying to find a place they could afford, and they couldn't. They couldn't find a place they could afford to buy in and around Stowe. You, you think about Stowe, oh yeah, of course, it's, it's a really hot vacation spot. So they are moving back to Michigan where they came from. Mm -hmm. And that's a really sad story, sad for Vermont. And it's we, a sort of pattern we see repeated here in New Hampshire as well. We did a labor shed, um, which I think is the greatest phrase, just to pause for a minute. Labor sheds are like watersheds for folks and it's where the labor for a region comes and goes to the same way a watershed is where the rivers and streams and floodplains come and go. So we did the labor shed study in Wyndham County and the surrounding counties, because we're sort of in the, we're very much in the tri-state area or a tri-state area, the tri-state area, certainly not. Um, <laughs> but what we saw is exactly what you described, that we have people with incredibly long commute times to get between where they work and where they live because of wages and affordability not necessarily lining up. And what really, you know, 
exacerbates that so much is both the fact that if you're making an hourly wage, the cost to travel is quite extraordinary extra cost and really hard to figure in when you're looking to find affordable rent. Um, it's really hard when you're budgeting at that level of stress to really thinking about both of those numbers together because one is so much more fixed than the other and so much more regular than the other. Um, yeah, that, that's a really important point. And, and for, for folks to, to want to explore this on their own, there's a great website um, that is created by uh, the, the Center for Neighborhood Technologies, CNT. Uh, it's called the Housing and Transportation Index. And it, it looks at each census tract and does this sort of it's fairly crudely analysis that you were just talking about having done uh, for Wyndham County. Um, so you can look at your own community and figure out you know, what the typical cost is for housing and how far people are traveling, what your transportation costs are. Uh, to get to your job from where you live. Um, and it's it's a helpful way at looking at broader patterns. And then I'm thinking about last week, we had on a member of Vermont's Climate Council to talk about the work that they've been doing. Um, and she's an appointed representative from a rural community. That's sort of part of why she was appointed as she lives in a mountain town, a very high tourist mountain town. Um, and that when we think about the impacts on climate change, and I know how incredibly defensive rural folks feel about um, some of sort of density arguments and people's, um, some of the jargon and some of the stories about what we're gonna need to do for climate change and everyone's gonna need to move down to the cities and we're gonna empty out a rural area so that we don't, you know. Um, and I recognize that fear that people have, but what I think is a much more real thing for us to fear is the incredible carbon impact of folks who are working in some of those areas and living in the dense areas and traveling back and forth. And that the more we can have people actually living where they're working in the mountain towns, um, mm -hmm. much lower carbon footprint for our states. And it's so lower costs. We are just about out of time and, and we need to go to break, but Ben, quickly, before we do that, what, what would you like to leave listeners with at this point? Any closing thoughts for now? Well, I think let's go back to what we started with and that, um, you know, the prevalence of vac vacation homes or second homes in communities can be helpful for taxes, but it's not great for community building. Thank you. The Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro will return in a moment. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us on iTunes, Brattleboro Community Television, or the peg station nearest you in some cases, as well as Emily's YouTube channel and our Facebook page and our website, montpelierhappyhour.captivate.fm. I started to forget all the different places. <laughs> hey, Emily, what do we need to remind listeners of? The views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those <laughs> of the hosts and the guests and not the station they're being played on, the organizations that the folks are connected to. It's just the opinions of the host and the guests. Thank you. Why, thank you. And speaking of guests, if you are just joining us, we are speaking with Ben Frost, who's the Managing Director for Policy and Public Affairs with the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, also known as New Hampshire Housing. And we are talking about what it means to have a large vacation home uh, market in com uh, small communities or communities in general. And uh, Ben, I would um, love to hear if we could pick apart some of the issues around taxes and, and the costs of having a, a second home or a vacation home market to for communities. Sure, well, you know, this is the, uh, chief argument uh, in favor of resort development um, because you know resorts don't introduce kids to the schools. Uh, they don't, well, unless you have a bunch of skiing accidents, they don't have 
you know, uh, press upon the uh, services of uh, local emergency response uh, that much, uh, although I think that is debatable. Um, so they, they, you know, they're seen as a way of uh, increasing the so-called tax base of communities as a means of mitigating uh, long-term increases in taxes. Um, at least that's the, that's the, um, that's the argument. Uh, whether it is actually borne out in reality is a different question entirely. Uh, and so I have a lot of thoughts about how it's borne out in reality that I've been noticing lately and thinking about, um, partly because I'm friends with someone who's a town clerk in a ski town. And so, uh, um, and so here are some very fun stories from them. So I, Absolutely, the schools, yes. Um, but beyond that, when we think about the cost to the town, I think there's some really interesting ones. So I think emergency services are used a lot. I think folks in ski areas are much more accustomed to um, immediate medical services than I think some folks in our rural communities are used to. So I think folks go to um, seek medical care much more often in you know, sort of more urban areas and expect the same when they're here, as well as also just sort of ski accidents. Um, I think we see a lot more calls for ambulances in our ski areas and we're, we know we're actually, at least here, we're experiencing some major um, scarcity call challenges. It's really straining the entire 911 system here. Um, and then, the expectations around what good infrastructure is, I think are very different for tourists than they are for residents in terms of the scale of road pavement um, and the types of cars that people from out of state drive, um, how well plowed a road needs to be to be drivable, um, what delivery looks like, concerns and understanding of um, waste systems so both stress on wastewater systems, but also um, in Vermont, I'd be curious to hear about it in New Hampshire, but I believe this is true in New Hampshire. The way you dispose of your garbage is fairly complicated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Good point. Um, I think folks who are coming here from away don't necessarily understand, nor could they or should they. It's way mm -hmm. too complex, but there's very much this sort of like insider trading on like how you get rid of your garbage or... Um, how you get some sort of basic infrastructure services. And so the fact that people don't know those things also has a few a huge cost to municipalities because they're calling for services that they wouldn't necessarily call for otherwise. Or I remember there was a drowned goat in a stream recently somewhere that I was. And there was a bunch of tourists around and they're like, call the police, call the, and I was like, one, I have no cell phone service. And two, like, those are not the appropriate people to call for the drowned goat. It's dead already. <laughs> so yeah. that's like super, there's a lot of super funny stories that are like the very exaggerated versions, but I think there are a lot of um, extra costs because of increased expectations. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I, I think that's uh, you know, spot on. Uh, and, and I think it, it, it does depend in part, um, the, the impact depends in part on um, what sorts of vacation homes we're talking about. If it is, an integrated resort, then they're going to have trash collection. In there. Mm -hmm. But if you're renting someone's house, what do you mean you don't have trash pickup? I, I've got to take it to the dump. If you have a dump or transfer station, um, so I, I think we we see a lot of the same issues here uh, in New Hampshire, um, and people coming, I say, from away uh, with certain more urban expectations of what is to be provided to them. Uh, rather than having them fend for it uh, on their own, um, and so you get those you get those weird calls, uh, you get the the, the strange uh, inquiries, uh, and people are left um, you know feeling like the, you know you know so what am I supposed to do about this thing? Well, you're supposed to take your trash home with you and dispose of it properly, uh, not find the nearest McDonald's with a dumpster and put it in there because they have to pay for your disposal now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think there are those impacts. You know, Emily, you talked about the, the the pavement issue, and I was thinking about the overall transportation infrastructure issue. Uh, so you know, we've got in New Hampshire, we've got I ninety three, the the corridor from Boston going up to the mountains and the lakes. Um, Friday, you know, I work in Bedford, and, and, which is the first town west of Manchester, 
and I drive to Warner, which is about a 40 minute drive. Uh, and my normal route is on I-93. When I'm leaving work uh, this afternoon, I'm gonna check uh, Waze or Google Maps to see what the traffic is like before I head up on I-93 because it might be backed up for miles. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're investing in uh, massively in uh, the I-93 expansion uh, to accommodate all of this traffic, uh, which is, you know, it's great for the tourism economy. It'll get people to the mountains, mountains and the lakes faster, um, but it is an extraordinary expense. Um, and meanwhile, you know, most of the time I-93 is, does not need that capacity. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and, and the locals know well enough to avoid uh, the highways uh, during those times if they can. Uh, sometimes they don't have the option. So, I, you know, we, we, we make these choices, we do this sort of development, some of which, a lot of which is locally driven. You know, municipalities in both states choose development patterns. Uh, we, we might think, well, you know, it's, it just happened. No, our, our, our comprehensive plans and our zoning ordinances and our land use regulations are essentially the rules of the game for developers. They are they're what we're telling developers we want in our communities. And if we want resort development, that is what is embodied in our, in our comprehensive plan and our zoning ordinance. Um, so those are, those are local decisions and the permitting decisions, and I recognize there are differences, distinct differences between New Hampshire and Vermont on, on land use permitting. You've got Act 250, New Hampshire does not. Um, but still, it is still locally driven. Absolutely. But, mm -hmm. but there are regional, sometimes statewide impacts of these uh, uh, accretion of local decisions all coming together. Uh, and so one town approving one development might not have much noticeable impact outside of its boundaries. But each town making those sorts of decisions over the years, time and time again, has a noticeable, measurable, significant impact. Mm -hmm. So how can communities, when they're considering their development patterns and their zoning, if they are um, either hoping for, wanting whatever, uh, maybe like a resort or, or more, more vacation related development, how can they tease out these, like what should they also be considering for impacts around like our conversation with taxes and roads and, and that type of thing besides just the permitting process? Well, it, you know, in, 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 in your comprehensive plans, you need to be thinking about where you want development to happen um, and you know, what kind of development you wanna happen. And I'm not familiar enough with uh, the Vermont taxing structure, but here in New Hampshire, we have a few tools that are available at the local level. I would say not enough tools yet that municipalities can use to induce certain types of development using the local property tax and, and locally granted exemptions to foster certain types of development, whether it's rehabilitation of downtowns or now new development of housing. Uh, so those are, those are tools that are available to municipalities to encourage uh, development to happen. Um, beyond what that- What I hear I you saying though, bef what I heard you saying though, is that when a town is considering or a village is considering its own development, um, it might not be considering how that development is impacting communities for towns over that will then be driven through. In instance. all likelihood it's not. And yeah. so thinking regionally about these kinds of patterns and how one act influences the other is something that we um, don't do as often as we could here because we have really no county government. No, but you do have regional planning commissions. We do, yeah. Have a very distinct and important role in Vermont. I'd say an important role in New Hampshire too, but less, uh, they have less uh, power associated mm -hmm. with them than the Vermont regional planning commissions do. Now, the Vermont RPCs are, are really important in the local development scheme because of Act 250 and the, the ability of the uh, Regional Planning Commission essentially to help guide development from a regional perspective. Uh, and so I, I think for communities uh, that are looking at the possibility of different types of development, they should be turning to their Regional Planning Commission and uh, asking them, well, what do you think about this? 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so can I ask about taxes? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So you touched on sort of incentive structures. Um, and before the break, we talked about um, the idea of expanding the tax base by adding um, non-primary homes. So here in Vermont, we have our, um, our residential tax structure is basically um, divided between, this is vastly simplified, but divided between two different rates, we have property tax for residential and property tax for non-residential. And non-residential includes non-homestead non properties, basically. Um, so places that are not primary homes and um, businesses and rental units um, and non-developed land. So that's, those are four very different categories that we've all put into sort of this same rate structure. And then we have in statute that the base rate for the state should always sort of, um, the homestead and the non-homestead should be moving together. So I'm curious to hear from you and you all tax such different things than we do and you like to hide your taxes in little nooks and crannies. Um, so would love to hear more from you about how you see New Hampshire being able to benefit from your non-primary home. Um, well, so to, to look at the New Hampshire tax structure in a very simplified uh, view is uh, there's the local property tax and then there's the state stuff. Uh, so the local property tax, we, so in New Hampshire, we rely much more on the local property tax uh, uh, than Vermont. Although I know Vermont does rely on that quite a bit. Um, in New Hampshire, the, the local property tax, the, uh, the, the municipal tax, the school district tax, uh, and then there's also the statewide property tax, which gets redistributed to municipalities for education. Um, those are uh, the, the lion's share of what goes on at the municipal level. And so um, that's what people are focused on. Uh, the state runs on other sorts of taxes mm -hmm. right, and fees. So uh, Emily, you're right. There's a lot of hidden fees uh, that the legislature uh, has passed over the years that run state government. Um, so there's very much in New Hampshire a distinction between local taxation and state taxation. Uh, and there's not a lot of interplay between the two. Uh, and so for your local taxation, are the is there a distinction between primary residences and non-primary no. residences for tax? Everyone has, every property has the exact same tax rate, businesses included? Uh, that, and that is a constitutional issue. Wow. That is written into Interesting. Yeah. So much gratitude for our constitution all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah, so there's not a lot of flexibility there absent changing the New Hampshire constitution. Wow. That's so interesting. And how do you change your constitution in New Hampshire? And I'm sorry if I am asking sure, something. Sure. So I, you know, I, I am a lawyer, so I, I okay. actually do know some of this stuff. Uh, so the New Hampshire constitution uh, is done for initially by the legislature. Uh, so the legislature, both houses of the legislature have to pass something by, I think it's a two thirds majority uh, of the members, not those present, but the okay. actual members. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then it bypasses the governor and goes straight to the voters on the statewide uh, November election. Uh, so that would be as a warrant article on each municipal ballot, uh, whether they approve of this uh, change to the constitution. And there, it does happen from time to time. Uh, the most recent change to our constitution dealt with, um, I think, privacy issues and, and that you know, the, your personal information is inherent to you and uh, is not, and you own it essentially, which is mm -hmm. yeah, I think a pretty good thing. That's very interesting that you passed that. Um, we have actually almost the exact same constitutional change process here in Vermont, um, but we have to do it over two biennium. So it goes um, House and Senate, two thirds of all members, not two thirds of who's there, bypasses the governor and then has to come back up the next biennium for the exact same vote and then goes on a referendum to the voters. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it takes a bajillion years. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, Emily, did you have all your questions answered? I have all taxes? my questions because since they can't differentiate, there's like no policy levers there at all. It's even harder than <laughs> ours. 
Well, I mean that that's a good a, a good point though. There there are some ways within the constitutional structure to um, deal with uh, taxation. So it, you in certain circumstances you can look at on commercial properties you can look at certain types of commercial properties based upon their their income as opposed to uh, their market value but mm. those are those are uh, narrow exceptions and can you add um like view fees or um well vacancy yeah. can you add a vacancy fee is that there, there is I love um, fees over there you, you, you can't do that on the local tax bill. Okay. But uh, a number of years ago, uh, the uh, um, appraisal companies, the assessing companies that were hired by municipalities started separating out the value of a view on a particular property. And people viewed that as a view tax. They saw it as a separate tax when really it was it was simply the value to the property of having a view, uh, which you can you can figure out. If, you know, having a view does increase the market value, mm -hmm. but the fact that it was being separated on a tax bill uh, um, made a lot of people really upset. Um, you know, especially the farmers who were saying, "My cows don't appreciate the view," and so the, really the legislature the legislature addressed that. I don't think that they substantively changed the law. Um, but at least um, people felt better about how it was being addressed locally. So I want to shift gears um, in the interest of time and talk about the COVID migration, quote unquote. How have you seen that play out in, in New Hampshire? And, and I know we're still sort of in COVID, everything hasn't sugared off yet, but what are you anticipating or what are you keeping an eye on as far as impacts go? It, there's a lot going on here, and you know it, the. I'll, I'll park the the tragedy of COVID to the side here, and just acknowledge it. And this is a a really difficult time, and um, tragic for many many people. Um, it's also from a an analysis standpoint, it's fascinating to see what's going on, how people are changing their decision making what they're choosing to do, where they're choosing to live. Uh, and there's a lot of um, anecdotal stuff out there too. Some of it uh, kind of apocryphal, um, you know, so you, you, you listen to the, the realtors in New Hampshire and they're saying, oh, it's, you know, and the, the purchase market is just nuts. Uh, so the median sale price in Rockingham County, the, the seacoast area of New Hampshire uh, was over $700,000 uh, last month, uh, which is just astronomically high for New Hampshire. Um, and what they're saying is it's all the out-of-state buyers. Hmm. Well, so we've been looking at this and we, we, we actually buy the data on all deed transactions. We filter it out and we look at uh, where people are coming from when they're buying homes in New Hampshire. And historically, most of the purchasers in New Hampshire are from New Hampshire. Hmm. Uh, there has been in the past couple of years an uptick in the proportion of buyers from Massachusetts in particular. Um, a slight, almost, I would say almost imperceptible increase in buyers from other places too, globally. You know, uh, sometimes it's Arizona, sometimes it's Connecticut, sometimes it's Rhode Island, sometimes it's Vermont or Maine. Um, but mostly the, the out of state buyers uh, in New Hampshire are coming from uh, Massachusetts. So between, uh, say, 2019 and 2020, those two years uh, in whole, uh, the proportion of buyers from Massachusetts went from about 16% to about 19% of the market. It's not a whole lot, not a big change. But what's happening in COVID? Um, it has gone up still some more. So we have numbers through the, the end of the first quarter in 2021, and it's up over 20%, maybe 21% of the buyers from Massachusetts. A change, yes. Uh, a huge change, mm, not so much. Um, you know, we, we also looking at county by county data, and I think there probably is more impact in the border communities. So Rockingham County, Hillsborough County, Nashua, Manchester, uh, Portsmouth, uh, Dover, Rochester, the, the communities surrounding all of those areas uh, that are easily accessible uh, to the Boston metro area. It's an easy commute down, well, on the traffic. Uh, it's a short, 
in time and distance, not necessarily time commute. Um, so those are the, those are really appealing for people who want to get away from Boston, but not be too far that they can't commute. Uh, so I think, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, I think yeah. that's really interesting. And we call sort of the folks from Massachusetts, we call them flatlanders here. And, um, but while we're seeing sort of that trend slightly with people moving from Massachusetts to Vermont, what we're also seeing is folks moving from our met quote metropolitan areas. So Burlington um, or even Chittenden County proper to Franklin County, which is just a little more rural to the north. And so we're seeing the same trends in state as um, slightly, you know, and again, along the border, not people moving all the way to the kingdom. And so I think it's, um, I think sort of this natural desire to get from the very densely populated to the slightly less densely populated um, happens within our states just as much as it might happen across the border sometimes. And so that's an interesting piece of that to me. I think that is happening. And I think uh, another thing is happening too. And if you look at uh, the 2020 census county data and you just look at a, a map showing uh, which counties lost population and which counties gained population, you see a, a continued depopulation of the very rural counties. Mm -hmm. So the plain states is still concentrating to the cities but not necessarily living in the cities but in the metro areas. So we see people perhaps leaving the, the, the downtowns and moving to the suburbs, people moving from rural areas to the exurbs. Uh, mm -hmm. There's an ongoing uh, continual con uh, concentration of population in certain areas. Um, mm -hmm. You know, looking at, at the, uh, where people are moving to uh, in New Hampshire, look at, at home purchases. Um, in uh, 2020, uh, the greatest percentage increase in home purchase prices year over year from 2019 to 2020 on a county basis. Uh, and the greatest percentage increase in the units, number of units sold were in our rural counties, not in our, our metro counties. Uh, mm -hmm. So they were in, you know, up north in Coas County in Grafton County, which is, you know, Upper Valley and, 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 and those areas, Carroll County in Mount Washington Valley. Uh, that's where we were seeing the greatest increase, percentage increase in sales prices year over year and uh, numbers of sales. People are have a greater interest in those areas now, in part because you can still get to Boston if you need to. Um, you can even, you know, it's a long drive, but even from Coas County, you can, it's a, like a three, four hour drive, you can still get there. It's not a commute, but if you need to go to say uh, a doctor's appointment in Boston, you can still do that. Uh, so mm -hmm. looking at the age of purchasers too, um, we find that in Coas County, the northernmost county in New, in New Hampshire, um, we have the greatest proportion among all counties of cash buyers, which is highly suggestive that people are buying vacation homes or moving there permanently from wherever else. Mm -hmm. Now, whether those patterns so stick, that's the real question. So there, yeah. there are COVID patterns, some of which have accelerated pre-existing trends, some of which are new. And the new ones, uh, the real question is, will they stick after COVID? We don't know. Mm -hmm. So we are almost out of time. And so I just want to touch in with you, Ben, and just see, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. What do you feel is really important for listeners to take away from this conversation? Um, I, I think perhaps the most important thing, we're talking about housing and housing development and, and building community. I think it's important for folks to recognize that, um, as I said before, um, you know, the type of housing that gets built has uh, so much impact on our communities. Resort development, great for the tax base, but development where people will live as their primary residence is what adds to our communities. Um, I when, when I walk around the, the streets of my town, I love hearing uh, the laughter of children. Uh, I do not wanna be in some dystopian town that is only old people who are paying their taxes. Uh, I wanna hear kids uh, walking on the sidewalks and playing in the playground. Um, and and that's, that's a sign of a healthy community. Thank you very much. 
That is all the time we have on today's episode, unfortunately. Thank you, Ben, so much for joining us today. If people want to find out more uh, information about uh, New Hampshire housing, where would you recommend they go? You can go to our website, which is www.nhhfa.org. Fantastic. Thank you. Emily, if people want to find more information for you or uh, reach out, where can they go? I don't have it conveniently behind my shoulder the way Ben does, but it's Well, that wouldn't help the listeners anyways. (laughs) It is emilykornheiser.org where folks can find my email, my social media feeds, some regular updates that have slowed this summer, um, and any notice of upcoming events. Wonderful. And as always, you can find the Montpelier Happy Hour at 2 p.m. on Friday on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us on iTunes and BCTV, at Emily's Place, our Facebook page, and the Montpelier Happy Hour.captivate.fm. Hey, everyone, have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>